Okay, well, welcome to the lecture on genetics. Uh, we've talked about cell cycle and the process of meiosis. Put that together, and now we're into genetics, especially meiosis. You inherited half of your DNA from your mother, half from your father. That set your genetic code. Um, what we're going to look at are the basics of genetics. We're still learning huge amounts of information about genetics and how these things work, and there are always exceptions to the rules. But what we're going to talk about are just some of the basic core foundations of genetics. That is what we call Mendelian patterns of inheritance. So Gregor Mendel was this Austrian monk, helped establish the foundations. Now, one of the basic rules in genetics is like begets like. It means like produces like. So you look at this couple here, mom and dad, you look at their hair color, their eye color, if we could go in and look at their blood type, etc. We would expect their kids to have inherited those traits, those variations, similar hair color, similar eye color, probably same blood type, etc. So that is the basic rule of genetics. Again, we're finding exceptions. There's still a lot we don't know about genetics. And, wow, we thought this should have happened, but something else actually happened. That's the fun part about genetics. It is a constant changing field of science. There's always new information. And as technology improves, our knowledge of genetics grows and improves as well. Okay, So as I mentioned earlier, one of the founders of genetics is this Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel. Now, Mendel was not the first person to study genetics. But he was the one, he was really the first person to, to actually kind of quantify genetic research. So he applied mathematics to his experiments. That was a huge thing. That was a big, big deal. He followed the scientific method as he was doing his research. So you think about, here's a hypothesis, here's an experiment, let's collect data, let's analyze the data, does it support the hypothesis, accept or reject, and then repeat. Mendel did that, he did a lot of repeating. He also kept detailed records of his research so it could be repeated. That's a huge thing in science. You have to have your recipe. You have to have your records. Otherwise, nobody else can repeat it to confirm. So Mendel is known as the father of genetics. But keep in mind, in science, no one individual does everything. He established some of the foundations. He was using previous knowledge from previous scientists. His information has been expanded upon and built upon by lots and lots of different scientists over the course of the centuries. But in the big picture, genetics is still a fairly young field of science, and we're always going to be learning new things about it. Okay, so some key terminology I want you guys to make sure you are comfortable with traits or trait. A trait is a characteristic found within a species. So let me give you an example here. Seed shape. Okay, All the seeds in the pea species, the pea plant species, will have a shape. Now, variations are going to be different varieties of a given trait. Okay, so again, an example here, when we're looking at the pea plants Gregor Mendel worked with, there's green and yellow. Those are the variations of the trait of color for the seed. We could talk about seed shape. Shape is a trait. Spherical or round versus this dented, kind of wrinkled, those are variations. We could talk about flower color. Flower color is a trait. The two main variations in the pea plants Mendel was studying were purple versus white. Okay, so what I want you to do is be comfortable with 
the difference between a trait and variations. In trait or traits, this is a characteristic found across a species. Variation are varieties of the trait. Now the allele or alleles are the pieces of DNA that carry the code for a variation or we would say the trait. All right, so seed shape might be represented by big S, big S. Maybe it's represented by big S, little s. Or maybe it's represented by little s, little s. Those are all the pieces of DNA, the alleles, that represent the variation. Or we could say the trait. All right, so it takes an allele from mom and an allele from dad, put them together, and now you have your variation of a given trait. So the parent pea plants, you had mom pea plant, dad pea plant. One piece of their DNA from mom, one piece of DNA from dad, one allele from mom, one allele from dad combined to create the offspring. The offspring inherited two alleles, which then were either big S's, little S's, or one big, one little, and then that is the genetics that the child inherited. Okay, so as we look at traits and variations in alleles, we want to keep in mind it takes two alleles to represent a variation. Now, if you are homozygous, both alleles are going to be exactly the same. Let me speak that exactly the same. This can be represented by and I'm just going to use T's for an example here. Any letter in the alphabet works. Big T, big T, or little t, little t. Okay? Those individuals who have big T, big T, or the individual who has little t, little t, we would call them homozygous. Now, an individual who is heterozygous, the alleles for the given trait are going to be different sized or sizes big T little t alright so if you're a heterozygous individual you inherited a big allele and in a little and a small allele for your given variation now when we look at variations some variations are dominant Okay, a dominant variation is going to be an allele or a variation that can block the expression of the recessive. We represent this with a capital letter, and it could be big T, it could be big S, it could be big A, big H, etc. Any capital letter represents the dominant variation. But again, keep in mind, dominant can block the expression of the recessive. It does not mean more common. Don't mix that up. Don't think, oh, dominance is always most, always going to be there. Not true. Not true at all. O blood type is a recessive blood type, yet it is the most common blood type. And we'll get into that later in genetics. Now, recessive is going to be the variation that can be blocked. It will only, let me capitalize that, only express when both alleles are recessive. And we use small letters to represent recessive alleles. So little t, little s, little a, little h, etc. That is how you express a recessive variation. Two little letters, two little t's, two little a's, two little etc. There's your recessive variations. Okay, so here's our example to look at. Earlobes. 
Grab your earlobe. Check it out. What kind of earlobe do you have? Is it attached? Is it unattached? So, simple example. You got one parent over here with an unattached earlobe, big dangly earlobe, and they happen to be what we call heterozygous or a carrier because they have the big E and the little e. The other parent, same genetics, big E, little e, heterozygous as well. Now they both express the dominant variation. They express the physical expression as, wow, I have this unattached earlobe, but they're carriers for the recessives. You wouldn't know it by looking at them. You can't look at them and go, yeah, your earlobe's dangling, but I know you carry that piece of DNA for attached earlobes. It doesn't work that way. You can't see that recessive allele if the individual has the dominant. So you put these two individuals together, big E, can go into the sperm, or little e could wind up in the sperm. So think about meiosis. Chromosomes rip apart when they produce sperm. Every sperm is genetically different. There you go. You have two sperm in this example. One sperm carries a big E. The other one carries a little e. Same thing with the eggs. Big E winds up in one possible egg cell. Little e in the other possible egg cell. And then we look at what are the potential outcomes. So what we're looking at here is a little thing called the Punnett square. It is just simply used to predict possible outcomes. What do we think could happen? So if the big E from mom combines with the big E from dad, child inherits two big E's, homozygous, dominant, unattached earlobes. If mom's, or let's go with, yeah, if mom's big E combines with dad's little E, heterozygous individual. But physically, they're still going to appear unattached. They're going to express the dominant variation, even though they carry the recessive. Same thing if dad's big E and mom's little E combine. Another heterozygous individual, but they express the dominant variation. They carry, but they express dominance. And then one out of the four possible outcomes could actually give us a recessive individual. It's possible, 25% chance, that those two parents, two heterozygous parents, will produce a child with attached earlobes. Two dark-haired parents have a blonde-haired baby. How'd that happen? They both carry recessive alleles, and it's a 25% chance. Okay, so when we look at this, what we want to look at is how this square here, this is known as the Punnett square, can give us predictions, possibilities. And we look at what are the possible phenotypic ratios. Phenotype refers to physical expression. What can I see physically? Physically, I would expect to see three kids with unattached earlobes and one child with attached earlobes. We'll also be using the Punnett squares to determine genotypic ratios, genetics. What are the genetic possibilities for these two children? Okay, so that's what we're looking at when we're talking about genetics and trying to get a handle on genetic scenarios. All right, so here's an example. Punnett squares predict odds. That's all they do. Couple's going to have a baby, 50-50. The odds are 50-50. 50% chance they're going to have a boy. You only have two choices, boy or girl. So the couple has a boy. Hey, second child's on the way. The odds are still 50-50 that your second child is going to be a boy. Now what changes is this thing called the probability. What is the likelihood you'll have two boys in a row? Well, that's where you multiply your odds, and you go one-half times one-half. The probability of two boys is one-fourth. We went to a third child. Odds are still one-half that you're going to have a boy, but the likelihood drops down to one out of eight. Your probability changes over the course of events, but your odds don't. So we'll apply this 
to making money in the next lecture.